It's a great pleasure uh, to give the lecture. <laughs> Malcolm and I go back uh, to 1985, where uh, there was a um, summer NEH seminar on character, life, virtue, and friendship. And uh, Malcolm proved to be a wonderful friend over the years. And the way he has served uh, Gordon is a testimony to us all of what it means to care deeply about students, and in particular, students in an institution like Gordon. I start with a epigraph. Analyzing humor is like dissecting a frog. Few people are interested in the frog dies of it. E.B. White. I start with a um, story that's meant to be funny from my years as a seminarian at Yale Divinity School. Every seminary generation developed their own form of black humor, and this was ours. It seems that John the 23rd had an archaeological expedition in the Holy Land. They made a great discovery that the head of the expedition thought presented certain theological problems. He called John the 23rd, announcing he had some good news and some bad news. The good news was that they had discovered the tomb in which Jesus was laid after the crucifixion. The bad news is the bodies in it. The head of the expedition thought he ought to alert John the 23rd to the findings before they were generally known because it might entail some theological rethinking. John the 23rd thanked the head of the expedition for letting him know because he did indeed need to pray and think about the news. So he prayed and he thought, but was unsure finally what to say. He thought to himself, my old friend Rudy Bultman has thought about these matters, and so he thought he would call Rudy up to see what he might say. So he explained to Rudy about his archaeological expedition and the finding of the tomb. He then warned Bultman that he had some bat that he had next to tell him what he might find deeply disturbing, but he had to tell him the truth if he was to get the help he needed. So he said to Rudolf Bultmann, the body was in the tomb. There was a long silence on Bultmann's end. John the 23rd waited and waited, fearing that Bultmann's faith had been shattered. <laughs> Bultmann finally responded, so he really existed. <laughs> This was a joke we told to seminarians in 1965. At the time, the joke certainly needed no explaining. Bultmann was the New Testament historian theologian we read. His presumption that we had little evidence to secure knowledge of the historical Jesus dominated discussions in New Testament scholarship. That Bultmann might be upset, or at least had to, had to reconsider his views uh, of the body, uh, that the body had been found, we thought quite funny. I confess I still find the joke not only funny, but a nice commentary on the scholarship surrounding the New Testament when I was in seminary. I suspect the story is not nearly so funny for current generations of seminarians. Bultmann simply does not dominate the New Testament scholarship the way he did when I was a student. Indeed, he can be read as deeply conservative thinker about questions surrounding Jesus given developments in New Testament scholarship since he wrote. Better put, theologically, Bultmann never doubted that Jesus matters, but I suspect that for the joke to work for current students, they will need some explanation that inform them about Bultmann and his scholarship. A familiar but often forgotten point about attempts to be funny that is, humor is profoundly contextual, depending, as it does, on common presumptions and habits. I begin with an example of a joke, but I take as my task to explore a more general question 
about, that the joke may suggest. I want to try to understand the role of humor in theology. Most of those who practice Christian theology think they're engaged in a serious science. That it is so should not be surprising, given the reality that at the center of Christian theology is a crucified savior. Moreover, any theology that is doing the work of theology may well, may well deal with the fundamentals of life, that is, life, death, and all the stuff in between, stuff like love and betrayal of love. These subjects are not only serious, but if truthfully addressed, sentimentality and superficial nostrum must be avoided. Humor can be one of the ways that sentimentality and superficiality can be defied. M.A. Screech observes in his erudite and wise book, Laughter at the Foot of the Cross, that man is a laughing animal. By the way, that was Aquinas's fundamental description of what it meant to be a human. We are animals that laugh. I mean, laughter is such a complex um, uh, behavior. Um, Screech traces that claim to Aristotle and Aquinas, a claim I might add I think to be more basic than the general characterization that the distinguishing characteristic of being human is rationality qua rationality. I call attention to Screech's observation, an observation he develops by close attention to the work of Erasmus and Rabelais in order to distinguish the question of whether and how theology can and should be funny from the question of the task of theology to provide an account of our humanity which entails being funny. These questions are obviously interrelated, but they are not the same questions. In this paper, I primarily am concerned with the former. By beginning with a joke, as well as using the description funny, I mean to distinguish what I'm about from attempts to characterize Christian theology in general by using genre categories such as tragedy or comedy. I have no reason to deny the general characterization, characterization of Christianity as comedic. It can be quite informative. For example, the comedy of, in the comedy of redemption, Christian faith and the comic vision in four American novelists, Ralph Wood argues quite persuasively that Christian vision of the world is fundamentally comedic. Drawing on insights of Carl Lois, Wood observes that because Christians do not, as the ancients did, regard the universe as eternal or divine, but as created, comedy is made possible by the acknowledgement of the sheer contingency of all that is. According to Wood, what the Christian faith confesses is that God in the Jews and Jesus had perpetrated the most outrageous of tricks, a joke to end all jokes, a surprise beyond all surprises. God has upset our tragic comma equilibrium in Israel and Christ. He acts unilaterally to deliver the human race from dialectical enslavement. I find Wood's account of the of, of the comic, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I find, I find Wood's account of the comic character of the Christian narrative to be quite insightful. I worry, however, that the use of tragedy and comedy to characterize the Christian worldview <coughs> runs into the, prom the problem of diverse understanding of tragedy and comedy. The concepts of tragedy and comedy depend so heavily on the literature they are meant to characterize, it is unclear how helpful those descriptions are when turned into general designations. Greek tragedy may have some resemblance to the tragedies of Shakespeare, but the difference Christianity makes for Shakespeare's tragedy means to characterize his plays, his plays and those of the Greeks as tragic may not be all that interesting. I say this as someone who once wrote a book called Truthfulness and Tragedy. In my defense, I was using tragedy to try to avoid lesser of two evil arguments that I still think may have something to it, but 
I didn't know what I was talking about when I said tragedy. Yet I do think, in spite of the considerable evidence to the contrary, that theology can and should be, in some sense, funny. Theology done right should make you laugh. Chris Hubner, in a recent article uh, entitled Make Us Your Laughter, Stanley Hauerwas's joke on Mennonite, makes some insightful comments about my use of laughter I find informative. For example, he calls attention to my poking fun at the Mennonite in a sermon to inaugurate the new president of Canadian Mennonite um, uh, College called On Milk and Jesus as my way to help Mennonites recognize what a funny people they are. <laughs> Namely, the sermon said, what Mennonites know is milk, their farmers, and Jesus. Hubner observes, my use of laughter is my attempt to practice theology in a manner that refuses the attempt to manage the world. In short, my use of laughter is an appropriate theological antidote, Hubner says, to the Constantinian desire to be in control. Hubner argues it is important to note that my use of laughter does not mean I lack an appropriate seriousness. He suggests, I think rightly, that there is no contradiction between something at once being serious and funny. I do, however, have a deep distaste for the clawing seriousness associated with some forms of piety. But my use of laughter to counter what I regard as feigned profundity is my attempt to offer, in Hubner's words, a response to the idolatrous temptation to take ourselves more seriously than God. Hubner calls attention to my self-designation, for example, as a high church Mennonite to illustrate how I use humor to make a serious theological point. He rightly suggests that I use the description as a joke. He doubts it is all that funny but credits my use of the description as a way to raise theological questions about how we define our identity. Hubner argues I'm trying, probably not very successfully, to call into question our preoccupation with identity. My use of high church Mennonite is but one expression of my general concern that preoccupation with neatness tends to generate models of theological discourse that are methodologically egoistic. Without laughter, our speech about that strange, surprising, and funny God we worship threatens to become speech about ourselves. By calling attention to the importance of humor and laughter in theology, I'm trying to suggest that theology should be done in an entertaining manner. Humor is not only a mode of entertainment that dis uh, uh, for the discourse of theology, but it surely is the case that we, and the we means most people, are often attracted to speech and writing that is humorous. An observation that calls into question the presumption by some that if you want, that if you want what you have to say to be entertaining, then what you have to say cannot be serious. I've tried to defy that presumption by attempting to do theology in a manner that tickles the imagination. For example, some years ago, I wrote an essay called A Tale of Two Stories on Being Christian and a Texan. That essay begins by acknowledging I want to entertain my reader by doing what I take to be this, the serious intellectual work. I wrote the essay first and foremost to honor my parents in, in the hope that if they read the essay, they would recognize how deeply I valued the way they had formed me to be a Texan without regret. I, I assumed such training was the necessary condition to be a human being. I, I mean, I always loved the, the motto of Baylor University, uh, which uh, pro-Texana, pro-Ecclesia, namely the only two ontological realities that matter. I, mean, <laughs> I also wrote the essay for my own amusement because I was able to use William Humphrey's great novel, The Ordways, to elicit what it means to be Texan. The novel, moreover, is filled with stories of Texans trying to make it in the hard land that was once, that 
made them at once humorous and sad. The serious intellectual work the essay was meant to do was to respond to the criticism that a focus on narrative as a basic grammar of Christian speech fails to appropriately acknowledge that no one narrative can or should constitute our lives. On being a Christian and a Texan was my way to show how different stories work to shape our lives. I also wanted to show how the different stories that, that possess us can be judged more or less truthfully by suggesting how the narratival general, how narratives generally recognized as Christian make how the stories of Texas must be told as well as lived. The great trick is how the injustice that is inherent in the stories that are Texas can be remembered without their being justified. I should like to think a tale of two stories is not only entertaining, but is so exactly because it's serious. There, and when I was raised, there was a town close to a Dallas called um, Greenville. And when you went through Greenville, uh, in the town square, there was a sign that said, the blackest land, the whitest people. That was Texas. That was Texas. How do you own that? How do you own that without trying to justify it? You better know how to laugh at it. Then, of course, there is my semi-famous essay, Why Gays as a Group Are Morally Superior to Christians as a Group. That short essay was meant to be funny by reframing the question of gay relationships in terms of their doubtful status in the military. By raising the question about why Christians could not accomplish that feat of being banned from the military as a group, I was trying to suggest how arguments about gays depend on the accommodation accommodated character of contemporary Christianity. I mean, why can't Christians get themselves banned from the military as a group? I, um, I mean, allegedly, allegedly we're just warriors. That screws up strategy. Uh, uh, would you want to shower with them? They're an evangelizing, baptizing sect. You never know when they want to lay it on you. I mean, why can't Christians get themselves banned from the military as a group? But if we could, then, as a matter of fact, wouldn't that make a difference for how arguments work about gay people? I mean, if, if Christians got themselves banned from the military as, as, as a group, would gay people want to be Christians? They got enough problems. Um, uh, there's more to be said about why theology needs to be funny, but I... Um, uh, but I want to call attention to the theologian I think may be the funniest in the Christian tradition, that is Karl Barth. Before doing so, however, I need to prepare the ground for Barth's humor by calling attention to the philosophical analysis of jokes. For it is by paying close attention to jokes we, we will be able to better able understand that jokes are no joking matter. I'd once thought to entitle the paper How to Tell a Theological Joke, but jokes are a more specific category than, than, um, than what it means to be funny. Jokes are funny, but not everything that is funny is a joke. However, by attending to an analysis of jokes, I hope to throw more light on what it means for theology to be funny. There's also the question of the relation between jokes, what is funny, and irony. It is probably the case that irony is more inclusive category than either jokes or what is funny. Jokes often employ irony, but irony is not always in the form of a joke, nor is it necessarily funny. Jokes often, um, there is no reason to assume, nor is it crucial for the case I want to make, that these conceptual questions must be settled. I'm content if the analysis of jokes I now will provide helps illumine what it means for theology to be funny. The question of the relation of theologian to, the the, uh, to their theology, of course, needs to be addressed. It is one thing to suggest that a theologian needs a sense of humor. It's quite something else to argue that their theology must be funny. I acknowledge the distinction, but I will maintain that not only should theologians know how to laugh at themselves but also their theology should also manifest the joy that reflects the glory of God. 
Of course, joy is not the same as what makes something funny, but what is funny depends first and foremost on a joyful recognition that God is God and we are not. The joke is on us. Ted Cohen has written a very insightful and funny book on jokes. He entitled the book, Jokes, Philosophical Thoughts on Joking Matters. Philosophical thoughts should not scare off any potential reader because the kind of philosophy Cohen represents does not need to call attention to itself. For example, he confesses when he first began to write about jokes, he thought, he could, he, he thought they could be divided into pure jokes and conditional jokes. A conditional joke would be those that only work with specific audiences. Cohen's exploration of jokes, however, has convinced him that there is no such thing as a pure joke. That is a philosophical point, but Cohen does not reference or elaborate the philosophical sources that clearly inform his judgment that there are no pure jokes. Obviously behind that is Wittgenstein and J.L. Austin. For example, he tells a joke about the president of a small college who wants to improve the school's academic reputation. The president is told the best way to do that is to create a few first-ranked departments. He first focuses on the mathematics department because he's told to increase their quality would, be very, would, be, would not be very expensive. After all, the only thing mathematicians need to do their work are pencils, paper, and wastebaskets. However, the ambitious president then judges it might even be less expensive to make the philosophy department rather than the mathematics department better because philosophers do not need wastebaskets. <laughs> you do not, I mean, I knew that would go well at Gordon. Right? <laughs> you do not need to be a mathematician or a philosopher or even an academic to enjoy this joke but you do need some understanding of mathematicians' demand for elegance, as well as philosophers' presumed professional license to say what they please because there's no way to prove them right or wrong. <laughs> Cohen notes that not all jokes require specialized information or professional jargon, but they may require a little knowledge about a specific subject. He, he provides an example of, a response of a man who is asked by a panhandler um, uh, outside a theater for a handout. The man declined saying, neither a borrower or a beggar be, William Shakespeare. The panhandler responds, blank you, David Manette. <laughs> as I noted, Cohen does not, as he might have done, call attention to philosophical accounts of rationality that would support his argument that there are no pure jokes. But he does rightly argue that every attempt to provide a general theory of jokes turns out to be a mistake. Of course, some jokes draw on what we assume a general knowledge of the human condition uh, consists in, such as jokes about death and illness. But that some jokes to work, but that some jokes seem to work on the basis of such knowledge Cohen argues is not sufficient to ground a general theory about jokes. Thus, the method of his, analysis, of his analysis of jokes depends upon exemplification. For example, the joke, one good thing about Alzheimer's disease is if you get it, you can hide your own Easter eggs, <laughs> might be one that anyone can get. But Cohen notes that some find such a joke disagreeable indicates how illness is experienced makes the difference for how such a joke is meant to work all that important. The fact that those with the disease as well as those that care for them are more likely to find the joke funny is but a further indication that we do not need a general theory about jokes any more than we need a general theory about what it means to be human. Rather, what we need is insight. Thus, the observation that those that find the joke funny do so because the joke helps them to defeat the loneliness associated with Alzheimer's. Cohen observes that he thinks what makes a successful joke successful 
is the sense held mutually by teller and hearer that they are joined in feeling. That good jokes are concise is due to the fact that so much can go unsaid because of what the teller and the hearer know in common. Cohen even uses the language of intimacy to describe what he takes to be the effect of a good joke. By intimacy, he means a shared sense of community, a joke at once reflects and creates. Members know they are in such communities, according to Cohen, to the extent that they can identify a shared set of beliefs, dispositions, prejudice, preferences, in short, a common outlook on the world and shared feelings. According to Cohen, these two conditions of community make jokes possible, can be cultivated and realized, without, cannot be cultivated and realized without jokes. But with jokes, our shared feelings are enhanced by our common outlook about the way things are. When we laugh at the same thing, according that something important is happening, that we laugh is uh, that we laugh at all is, he suggests, noteworthy. That is true even when we laugh alone, but when we laugh together, we experience the satisfaction of a deep human longing, the realization of a desperate hope. It is a hope that we are, are enough like one another to sense one another to be able to live together. Cohen argues, therefore, when a joke is successful, there's nothing to point to but the joke itself. That is, that is why you know if you have to explain a joke, you have an indication that something has gone wrong that cannot be fixed by explanation. When a joke is unsuccessful, you cannot show that the joke is really an example of some other case that should be acknowledged as funny. The joke either works or it does not, just as practical reason works or it does not. Cohen does not explicitly call attention to jokes as an exemplification of practical reason, but his account of how jokes work I take to be a compelling example of how practical reason, at least practical reason as understood by Eugene Garver, works. That is, jokes can be understood rhetorically as one of the means we have to make common knowledge common. Just as practical reason extends its range by engaging problems that would not exist without our being the kind of people we are, so jokes can be created by imagining a problem for oneself. Any subject will do. Cohen, for example, asks, what is a sacramento? It's, it is the stuffing in a Catholic olive. He, acknowledge, he acknowledges that this is not a great joke, <laughs> but it is one he and Richard Bernstein, who's a very distinguished philosopher, made up after having given themselves the challenge of making up a joke about pimentos. <laughs> Perhaps a better example is created by, on, by playing on certain words. Thus, the 85-year-old man's response to doubt about his claim that he has sex almost every night. For instance, this week I had it almost on Monday, almost on Tuesday, almost on Wednesday. <laughs> Cohen, observe, Cohen observes that though it is stimulating to explore new topos to jokes about it, it is even more stimulating when the topic is extremely specific. He uses as an example small jokes. What does a snail say when riding on the back of a turtle? Whee! <laughs> or a turtle was mugged and robbed by a gang of snails. When asked for a description of the robbers, the turtle replied, I'm sorry, but I just don't know it happened so fast. <laughs> Cohen suggests such jokes limits are comparable to Stravinsky's remark that the most strict and rigid musical forms, forms like the fugue, are the most liberating for the composer because they free one from the need to worry about too many possibilities and leave the composer to exploit his talent by being inventive within the confines of the form. What a great, 
I, I, I'm going to read that again because it's just it's, it's a great sentence. Namely, he suggests that Jokes' limits are comparable to Stravinsky's remark that the most strict and rigid musical forms, forms like the fugue, are the most liberating for the composer because they free one from the need to worry about too many possibilities and leave the composer to exploit his talent by being inventive within the confines of the form. I, I thought about, you know, that's what sermons should be. That's what sermons should be. Perhaps the most fundamental role of jokes, however, is their use to comprehend the unexpected and absurd aspects of life. We laugh at that which defies our ability to make sense of events in our lives. According to Cohen, laughter is an expression of our humanity, our finite capacity, our ability to live with what we cannot understand or subdue. We can dwell with the incomprehensible without dying from fear or going mad. The role of jokes is particularly important for those who are under the control of others, just to the extent jokes help those in such a situation to laugh at their opponent, and if they are lucky and the joke is very good, make their opponent laugh at themselves. Jokes often have a subversive character that cannot be acknowledged exactly because subversion is betrayed by being acknowledged. Yet there is no escaping how jokes deal with death. Death, moreover, is the subject, Cohen suggests, is the gateway that is the peculiar tradition of jokes associated with Judaism. For Cohen, Jewish joke telling reflects the Jewish acknowledgement of life's incomprehensibility. Jewish jokes also manifest the, san the sanctions internal to Judaism that are meant as a response to the incomprehensibility of life. Cohen provides a number of long Jewish jokes that underwrite certain Jewish stereotypes of themselves. For example, there was the elderly rabbi in Brooklyn whose piety was renowned but whose faith had begun to waver. Pondering his growing spiritual crisis, he reasoned as well as prayed that if only the Holy One would strengthen the rabbi's faith, he would ensure that the rabbi would win the United State, the, the New York State lottery. The rabbi waits for weeks and months, continuing to pray that he will win the lottery. Finally, standing alone before the Torah in the synagogue, he hears a rumbling and observes a brilliant light from which a beautiful, melodious voice that seems to come from every direction says, so new, buy a ticket. <laughs> Cohen thinks this kind of Jewish joke reflects the Jewish ability to laugh at the absurdity as well as to negotiate the imponderables of life. Jewish humor reflects the conception of human decency found in the Hebrew Bible in which the mystification of the world is a laughing acceptance a kind of spiritual embrace. Moses is the great exemplification of this response to the world, as before the burning bush he answered, here am I. That response is not funny, but, Bo but Cohen suggests that Moses' response has a quality that pleases God. It pleases God because Moses turns aside to look at what he cannot comprehend. Cohen uh, Cohen, in a like manner, argues that Abraham and Sarah's response to the announcement that they would have a child is paradigmatic for the development of Jewish humor. Such laughter, laughter that is the re response to the incomprehensibilities of the world, is nonetheless an acceptance of that same world. The world and its inhabitants are forever doing the damnedest things. It is one it is one Jewish mode of acceptance and appreciation to receive those things in their wonder. The, then the laughter may be heard in this echo of faith. This does not mean that, Jew, that Jews have a monopoly on jokes, yet there is a characteristic associated, association of Jews with joking 
spirit that Cohen argues is not accidental. It is the jokes of outsiders that explore a deep and lasting concern and fascination with the logic of language, Cohen argues, is a characteristic of Jewish humor. The obsession with language and logic, characteristic of Jewish humor, Cohen suggests comes from the bilingual character of Jewish existence in America. Yet he argues that bilingualism is not sufficient to explain the Jewish fascination with language. The Jewish tradition of reasoning and argument developed in the study of Jewish texts, Cohen thinks is crucial for understanding Jewish humor. For it is the characteristic of Jewish tradition that debate is not only necessary but unending. For example, Cohen tells the story from the Talmud of the debate between scholars about whether a cooking oven of a particular kind is ritually clean. The debate calls on God to support their judgment by dramatic action, which finally climaxes with a heavenly voice speaking in support of Rabbi Joshua. Rabbi Joshua's views are the correct ones. Rabbi ben Abraham and Rabbi ben Joseph said, where is it written, Yahweh, that your views can take the president over the Torah itself? <laughs> it is said then that Yahweh retreated saying, my sons have defeated me. That much of Jewish humor is directed at themselves is an indication of the Jewish confidence in who they are. Yet Cohen raises the question of how far one can go using humor to subvert oneself and still be oneself. Cohen thinks the Marx Brothers managed at once to be Jewish but American by making American humor Jewish. Of course, it's true that nothing could be more Jewish than entertaining judgments against the Jews. But Cohen worries that the negative judgments about Jews by people like Freud, Marx, and Wittgenstein may suggest a self-hate that is anything but Jewish. Cohen therefore concludes his wonderful short book by raising the question of when, if at all, a joke is inappropriate. He observes that the widespread conviction exists that some jokes on some occasions are morally objectionable. But it is not at all clear what makes a joke have the, its moral defect. He thinks it's unlikely to be able to answer what makes a joke immoral by appealing to some moral theory. Given the method of his book, a method that clearly shows the influence of Stanley Cavell, whom he claims as a friend, to, um, to appeal to a moral theory would betray the book. But just as important, Cohen does not think any theory could provide what he needed because theories cannot help but oversimplify the diverse character of the comedic. What most moral theories would try to show is that immoral jokes harm someone or reveal or reduces the moral character of the one who tells the joke. Cohen doubts that anyone can show these results obtained. Indeed, Cohen gives some friendly advice. If you feel a joke is no damn good, express your feeling of moral disapproval. If you are asked to defend your judgment by giving moral theoretical reasons for your negative judgments, ask your interlocutor why you need to ground your judgments in theory. Rather, what you must do is clearly a matter for yourself and, cho and choose your words carefully, making sure that the words are really your words. We rightly feel disgust when exposed to jokes that are clearly racist, but crucial for how the expression of that disgust is the availability of moral vocabulary to do the work that needs to be done. That is why Cohen's account of jokes is so compelling, I think. Namely, there are no pure jokes. There is no pure morality. It is all contextual. I've given an extensive account of Cohen on jokes because I find his analysis of jokes illuminating for thinking about why Christian theology should be funny. In particular, I will try to make a case for how theology can and should be funny by calling attention 
uh, to the humor and work of Karl Barth. I will end with a brief look at some of my own work. But before engaging Barth, Barth however, I want to explore a question Cohen's analysis of Jew Jewish humor has raised for me. Why is there nothing in Christianity equivalent to the genre of Jewish humor? As far as I know, there's no recognizable tradition of Christian humor comparable with Cohen's account of Jewish humor. Of course, Christians can be quite funny, but they are seldom funny as Christians. Is there something about the very content of the Christian faith that discourages Christians from having fun with our most fundamental convictions? For example, consider the following. Jesus was walking down a dusty road when a woman read to ran toward him because she was being pursued by a mob of men calling her by slanderous names and berating uh, and bent on killing her by stoning her. As the woman approached Jesus, he raised his arms, stopped the approaching men, and with eyes blazing, stared at the woman's pursuers and then said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Soon one man and then another dropped their stones and began to retrace their steps. It seemed clear that the men would disperse, but suddenly a rock from the back of the group of men came striking the woman in the head so that she fell to the ground. Jesus said, Mother, sometimes you really piss me off. <laughs> this is clearly not a very funny joke. I suspect many Christians would find it distinctively offensive. You just do not make fun of the mother of Jesus. Jesus may have told his parents he must be about his father's business, but Jesus is Jesus and we are not. What is it about the gospel narrative that the letter, in the letters of Paul that seem to inhibit Christian sense of humor? Does the dramatic character of the struggle against the powers of destruction at the heart of the gospel mean that Christians simply have no place for making fun of themselves and the world? As I suggested above, a story that has at its center a crucified savior just does not invite a jocular commentary. But there is the resurrection. I've always thought Thomas's recognition of Jesus profoundly comic. Jesus returns and offers his wounds to Thomas to touch. So Thomas's demand for confirmation might be met. Thomas, and the text does not actually say he touched Jesus, says, my Lord and my God. What an extraordinary response. He would have thought he would have said, oh, you're back. But, but instead, he confessed, Jesus is Lord. That confession surely has the ring of joy, if not laughter. The world will never be the same. In an extraordinary Easter sermon entitled, One Day You Will Laugh, Sam Wells observes that laughter is often used as a defensive manner to help us deal with unpleasant realities which often turn out to, uh, to be other people. But laughter can also be used as an attack mode to belittle. Thus jokes, to, jokes, thus jokes used to make us laugh at rather than with other people. It, in contrast, Wells suggests that laughter that is the resurrection is an infectious and an irresistible laughter that overwhelms all who it encounters with joy. If Wells is right about this, and I certainly think he is, or at least hope he is, the question remains why Christians have failed to see the humor that pervades our scripture and the lives of those who have preceded us. It's not my intention to worry over this question about how the gospel narratives may or may not inhibit or encourage what may be thought of as jokes or at least funny stories. I certainly think Cohen is onto something 
by suggesting that the very character of Jewish debate about the law invites an imaginative imagination open to what might be called the grammar of the comedic. Could it, could it be the very character of Christianity as a faith that one joins only by deep conviction and habit, inhibits a sense of humor about being Christian? Jews do not choose to be Jews. To be a Jew simply comes with the territory known as the body. Such a stance invites a confidence that one has nothing to lose so that one can even complain that given the, tri the, the trials Jews have gone through over the centuries, they can rightly wonder, is this any way to be chosen? I mean, Jews never think they have to protect God. Christians do. I suspect, however, for more, far more significant for understanding the difference between Judaism and Christianity on matters comedic is Cohen's suggestion that the long history of Jews being outsiders has implanted in Judaism a distinct tradition of humor. Christians have sought to be in control of the worlds in which we have found ourselves. If you desire to rule the world, the incomprehensibility of the world, Cohen suggests, is at the heart of Judaism must be denied or tamed. Constantinianism is but the name of the Christian attempt to make the world intelligible for Christians and non-Christian alike. What cannot be tolerated, therefore, are forms of humor that might make the attempt to control a dangerous world what it is, absurd. The subversive character of humor, often expressed in jokes, is an undeniable reality. Those that use humor to subvert the pretensions of the powerful often have little to, to lose. One might think that the eschatological character of the Christian faith would make Christians a people who have learned to live loose. To be able to so live is made possible by the recognition that the use of humor is a defensive or attack mode is indicative of a people enslaved by their fears. Christians can risk being subversive because they believe there is a deeper reality than the world determined by fear. There is, I believe, a close connection between Christian justification of the use of violence to bring order in a disordered world and the absence of humor. Christian nonviolence is surely an absurd position, requiring that you learn to live by your wits, which often takes the form of your ability to talk your way out of very tough situations. The great surprise that Christians are called to witness, the surprise that God became subject to our violence so that we might live nonviolently, is surely the basis of the Christian identification with the Jews. If I suspect, if, as I suspect, we are coming to the end of Christendom, we may, as Christians, discover that we indeed need if not have a sense of humor. I give as evidence of that development the work of Karl Barth. Karl Barth, the great enemy of cultural Christianity, I suspect was naturally funny, but his, but his humor was a reflection of the character of his theology. Only a person of profound sense of humor would write 14 volumes of the church dogmatics. <laughs> When Bart started volume four, um, uh, he said, I had a dream last night. I dreamed that I died and I went to heaven and I had a little red wagon with all 14 volumes of the church dogmatics. And I came to the pearly gates and Peter said, yes. I said, I'm Carl Bart. Peter said, yes. I'm Carl Bart. So I turned around and showed him of the church dogmatics. And Peter said, oh, yes, won't you come in? And Bart said, as he came down the streets of gold toward the throne with the great brilliance shining, the angels lined the streets, and as he pulled his wagon with 14 volumes of the church dogmatics, they all laughed. <laughs> in 
And with the grain of the universe, the church's witness and, and natural theology, I have a footnote in which I discuss Bart's report of an exchange between Harnack and Pedersen, in which Harnack challenged Pedersen to name which dogmas in which century and which church should have authority. Pedersen was a Protestant liberal who had become a Roman Catholic. Deeply sympathetic with Pedersen's commitment to study the Father, Bart maintained that theology requires the, theolo the theologian to identify with this or that confession of faith in this or that branch of the church, together with this or that proposed affirmation of the ancient church on which the confession rests. Yet Bart acknowledged that in the present day, theology has no church behind her, which has the courage to say unambiguously, this is of the highest concreteness. As a result, Bart observes that theologians are in a position dictated by King Nebuchadnezzar, who demanded that his wise men tell him not only what his dreams meant, but what he had dreamed. I observed that Pedersen became a Roman Catholic. Bart wrote the dogmatics. That he did so is surely a testimony to his profound sense of humor about the difficulties we are in. Jessel DeCoy helpfully locates Bart's more, uh, most extended discussion of humor in his ethics, which was originally written in 1928. Bart did not publish his ethics during his lifetime. One suspects because in this book, he was testing how to think about ethics with the result which would, which would um, receive mature expression only later in the church dogmatics. But I think DeCoe is right to suggest that Bart's fundamental attitude about the significance of humor in theology is developed there and never changed. It did not change because in the ethics, Bart grounded humor in the eschatological character of the Christian faith, which means it is incumbent upon Christians to refuse to take the present with ultimate seriousness. Such a perspective elicits a, a liberated laughter of Bart's description that derives from the knowledge of our final position, in spite of appearances to the contrary with present reality. Bart observes that humor is fluid and flexible because it reflects what, it, what is done in time, but from the standpoint of eternity. Bart says, humor arises when the contrast between our aeon is perceived and vitally sensed in what we do. Humor concerns the present as such with its strange connections and involvements. We cannot change the future into the present and the present into the future. We must persevere as best we can. We have humor when we do this. Accordingly, we must first laugh at ourselves so that we can laugh at others making possible the final task of being, laugh, uh, of being laughing with them. Bart concludes his account of humor by observing an observation clearly meant to be funny, that a serious problem with Calvin is that he seems to have been unable to laugh. Bart does not deny that we must also live with an appropriate seriousness about the present, but we cannot take the present with ultimate seriousness. Humor that is genuine, however, is that which is appropriately serious. Thus Bart's haunting remark, of humor too, one may say, that it is genuine when it is the child of suffering. Of humor too, one may say, that it is genuine when it is the child of suffering. From Bart's perspective, the great trick is to learn to live as a human being with the possibilities and limits that constitute our being human. Humor is liberation because it expresses an acceptance of our limitations in the light of an eschatological future. For Bart, humans are fundamentally, as Aquinas said, animals who laugh. Human humor pervades the dogmatics, but Bart explicitly discusses the significance of humor in his account of honor in Church Dogmatics 3-4. Humor is a necessary attitude for any account of honor because a person can only be honorable as an expression of pure thankfulness that the, that the honor that is due comes from God. Accordingly, the person honored by God finds themselves oddly the object of such esteem. 
Thus Sarah laughed on being told of the birth of Isaac. Bart asked, is not the contrast between the man himself and the honor due him by God really too great for man to take himself ceremoniously and not to laugh at himself in his quality of bearer and possessor? In the context of his discussion of honor, Bart displays his characteristic humor by recounting a story of a person who is reported to have died because of a negative review of his book. Bart clearly, with tongue in cheek, declares, but he had no business to do that. I do not know if Bart meant for that judgment that the man had no business to do that to be funny, but it's hard to believe Bart did not recognize at once how silly as well as how funny it is for him to make such a judgment. He should not have done that. Decoy calls attention to John Updike's observation of Bart's humor and love of combat as evidence of Bart's being genuinely indulgent of the world. Perhaps nowhere is that judgment better confirmed than Bart's love of Mozart. For example, in the preface of Church Dogmatics 3-4, and often Bart's self-depreciating humor is in display in his prefaces, Bart confesses while he still enjoys debate, he has gradually acquired more and more feeling for the affirmation by and which we can live and die. But, and you can hear the but coming, Bart observes that while he's gotten used to and does not respond to the criticisms of neo-Calvinism, the neo-Calvinists of the Netherlands, who accuse him of being a monist, they have finally gone too far and he must respond. Bart observes, it is one thing to criticize Bart, but they have gone too far because they have tried to offend Bart by the disparagement of Mozart. Bart observes that, of course, in doing so, they have shown themselves to be men of stupid, cold, and stony hearts to whom we need not listen. <laughs> Some years later, in the preface to Church Dogmatics 4.2, Bart returns to the conflict with the neo-Calvinists. He begins by saying he needs to make some necessary amends. He observes the wrath of a man seldom does what is right in the sight of God. Responding to the publication of Burkhauer's book on Bart's theology, a book that treats Bart so fairly, Bart says he must withdraw his ill-founded words he unleashed against the neo-Calvinists so they will have nothing in the future to fear from Bart, so long as, quote, they do not say anything more unseemly things about Mozart. Some may find Bart's love of Mozart odd, given Bart's attack on all forms of cultural Christianity. But as Ralph Wood has argued, exactly because Bart's theology was so sure of the victory of Christ, he, will be, he was free to enjoy the world. Bart, according to Wood, understood that the Bible contained the one ultimate cause for laughter and rejoicing. Its joy is not the cheap and easy, but something deep-seated and lasting. Indeed, it often comes reluctantly. We may as well admit it, Bart says of the believer, he has something to laugh at, and, and he just cannot help laughing, even though he, even though he knows uh, he does not feel like it. From Bart's perspective, Mozart, as well as many who are necessarily Christian, have done, heard the harmony of creation to which the shadows also belong. Which finally brings me back to me. A number of times when being introduced before giving a lecture, the story is told of my encounter with a student at Harvard. It seems I was walking across Harvard looking for the library. Not sure I was going in the right direction, I asked an undergraduate if he could tell me where the library is at. He responded by observing, at Harvard, we do not end sentences with a preposition. <laughs> I am said to have responded, can you tell me where the library is at, asshole? <laughs> There 
There's just one problem with that story. It did not happen. <laughs> How the, however, the story now seems to have reached a canonical stage so that it makes no difference whether it happens because the story confirms for many both negative and positive judgments about my use of humor. I think I'm at, I think I'm at my best as a humorist in prayers and sermons. So I think it appropriate to bring to an end this paper with this prayer. Funny Lord, how we love this life you have given us. Of course, we get tired, bored, bored, worn down by the stupidity that surrounds us. But then that stupid person does something, says something that is wonderful, funny, and insightful. How we hate for that to happen. But thank God you have given us one another, ensuring we will never be able to get out, get our lives in order. Order is finally no fun, and you are intent on forcing us to see the humor of your kingdom. I mean, really, Lord, the Jews? But there you have it. You insist on being known to such a funny people, and now us, part of your joke on the world, Make us your laughter. Make us laugh, and in the laughter, may the world be so enthralled by your entertaining presence that we lose the fear that fuels our violence. Funny Lord, how we love this life you've given us. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much.